and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here this morning. I've watched a good number of these talks online and found them very useful. I'd also like to say, uh, just pay a short tribute to the, uh, to the association. It didn't exist when I was diagnosed, and one did feel very lonely. There was an American chat line, but a lot of it just didn't seem relevant to the experiences I were having. And then this organization arrived, and it made a tremendous difference. So thank you. Thank you very much to you. Um, I, from looking at other people's stories, I know that I've had a much easier time with CLL than many. But there are two particular things I've learned from my personal experience that I'd like to share with you. You, you may know them. I didn't, uh, and I wish I had. So first of all, some, um, some personal details. I'm 75. I'm a solicitor. I live in London with my partner. He's Chinese and a software engineer. So hence some of the technology which I may or may not be able to use, but anyway. Um, now, I was diagnosed with CLL uh, about 16 years ago uh, as a result, as with many, as a, of a standard health check. And um, I, it seems to have been found very early. My lymphocyte count was five as against the standard three. Um, I was referred to a consultant who confirmed it, but I didn't actually take to him very much, and I decided to transfer to the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, I was told I'd be, before I transferred, I was told I'd be on watch and wait and caught very early, nothing really to worry about. And whilst I was waiting to see the uh, consultant at the Marsden, I fairly quickly became utterly exhausted. And it, towards the end, it became quite difficult to move. And also, my urine turned bright orange. It was sort of like transparent orange juice. And I arrived at the Marsden, uh, and the consultant took one look at me and instantly said I had a complication of CLL called autoimmune hemolytic anemia in which the white cells attack the red cells. The reason for the change of colour of one's urine is the dead red cells being washed out of the system. I'd lost about two-thirds of my haemoglobin. They... Um, put me to my horror in a wheelchair and wheeled me to a room. And even more, uh, even more alarming, outside the room was a table with a number of leaf inform information leaflets on it. And a big stack were entitled, What to do when a patient dies. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that, that gave me quite a jolt, and I think I, I, I do need to take that seriously. Um, when I was in hospital for a week, and um, given blood transfusions and started a long course of steroids. Uh, I was told this thing could recur and several years later I did notice a slight change in the colour of my urine. I spoke to my, uh, my consultant, was immediately put on a very light dose of steroids and if it was the AIHA returning that seemed to stop in its tracks. So the first thing I'd like to say to people is that Although I gather autoimmune hemolytic anemia is a fairly rare complication, if you do see your urine changing colour, particularly if it's going slightly orange, that's potentially life-threatening, and you do need to do something about it immediately and not delay, as I did, thinking, oh, the body will get better. So that was the first point I wanted to make. And after that, I was on watch and wait for 11 years, during which really nothing much happened. I didn't have the weakness that people have. I didn't feel, um, I didn't find it particularly stressful. I felt I was in good hands. I had checkups. I think it started every three months and it became every six months. And also um, during that period, fairly on in that period, um, I'd retired from the firm I was with and I became very much involved with a free legal advice centre. We have drop it, we run drop-in clinics now next to Westminster Abbey. Before COVID we were seeing about two and a half thousand people a year. Um, every subject under the sun comes in and I must say I, I adore doing it. Um, you see such a cross-section of London life. I remember looking around the waiting room on one occasion and there was a um, 
a Chelsea pensioner in full scarlet rig. There was a homeless Romanian. There were three shop assistants. They were all on minimum wage. They'd been fired, but they worked at a fashionable clothing boutique, so they were dressed to the nines in elaborate designer clothing. And there was a woman who worked at Buckingham Palace seeing the Queen on a daily basis. So you get all sorts of life coming in. And although we, we say we're there for people who can't afford to pay lawyers' fees, but we take the view that's everyone. But occasionally we get people coming in, we think maybe you shouldn't help them. And one particular favourite I do remember was a young, young banker who'd come in and he'd been paid off a very substantial sum, several hundred thousand pounds, by, by his bank. And uh, he wanted legal advice on the tax implications of it. And I said, you know, that, that amount you really should be paying for legal advice. He said, no, no, you don't understand. Two days after getting it, I lost it all on the roulette tables. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we do see a lot of human life, and I must say I adore doing that. Um, well, so, as I say, I had 11 years watch and wait, during which nothing much happened, but then the blood counts showed that I needed chemotherapy. I think I was on FCR. I was due to have six cycles. The first went well, but the second went very badly, and my temperature shot up. Uh, there was no doubt about it. I could hardly move from one side of the room to the other. And uh, I found myself back in hospital for about 10 days over Christmas on, a, uh, on an antibiotic drip virtually the whole of that time. Um, uh, but despite that adverse reaction, um, a remission did result. And so I was back on watch and wait for about, uh, for almost two years. But the, um, I, I came out of hospital in early January. And of course, I'd been shielding during that time. As one now knows, it was quite a good dress rehearsal for COVID. And I felt terribly claustrophobic and indoorsy as I started to get better. And I wanted to do something to show a sort of, um, uh, show that I was better. I felt better, but out of form. I'm a sporadic long distance walker. I've walked, um, I've trekked in the Himalayas several times. I've walked the coast, the uh, coast to coast walk. I've done the West Highland Way. And um, suddenly as a result of a, um, listening to a BBC uh, uh, radio programme, I found there was a path from Canterbury to Rome. Now, that actually goes across the north of France, which is rather boring, so I, I changed that. And on the 30th of April, 2019, I think this was, is that going to show up? Yes. Um, I took the uh, boat ferry from Harwich to the Hoof of Holland and started a walk the length of the River Rhine to Rome, and um, it was fabulous actually. It took me five months. I um, went to the source of the Rhine, which is a little lake uh, high in the Swiss Alps, then carried on over the um, St. Gothard Pass, and I arrived in Rome uh, on the 28th of September, having done walked 1,675 miles. Um, to be honest, I walk for three days, then I have a rest day. In some ways, it's walking from one comfortable Airbnb to another. So, <laughs> so many things. When you break it down, it's not quite as challenging as it may seem. But, um, gosh, that blew the cobwebs away. I felt so, so fit as a result of that. Um, well, then, anyway, after, um, after I came back from that, I... Um, and by the way, one of the main problems on, um, on that walk was getting the pharmacy at the Royal Marsden to prescribe enough ibrutinib for me to, so I didn't have to keep going back to them. It's an expensive drug. I gather it costs £55,000 a year. And they are immensely mean in giving one the supplies. But anyway, we were able to persuade them to give me six months' worth of it. Um, so anyway, I, I, I was put on to... Um, sorry, it was another time when they... Oh, it's difficult difficulty there, but anyway, I was put onto ibrutinib. Then we had um, then we had lockdown, and again I was feeling rather claustrophobic. 
the ibrutinib was having no side effects that I could tell. And so I suddenly realized when the hotel was open that there was another famous walk on my doorstep. And so on the 22nd of May, I walked, started a walk from Land's End to John O'Groats. Um, and again, it was a fabulous thing to do. I um, arrived on John O'Groats 102 days later. That was about 1,100 miles. And um, to show off slightly, I, I have a party trick that I've, I learned to do when I was seven. And John O'Groats is not the most remote place from Land's End. That's a place called Duncansby Head. And um, when I reached Duncansby Head, I phoned a friend to say I'd done so, and she said that if I would form this party trick, she'd make a generous donation to cancer research. So, um, <laughs> uh, so that earned a thousand pounds for cancer research, I'm delighted to say. Um, well, now, if I'd been giving this talk a few weeks ago, I'd have ended at this point. But uh, now this is coming to the second important point that I've, I'd like to communicate. Um, about three weeks ago, I had a general NHS checkup of everything. And they found that I had very high blood pressure. I was referred to, on, I saw him, and then on Monday, I saw a I think the title is cardio-oncologist. He's a leading cardiologist who, has, who specializes, amongst other things, in the impact of, of novel cancer treatments, including ibrutinib, on the heart. And he, he's put me on something like called Candistan. And next week, I'm to have various scans and to um, have a monitor fitted for 24 hours to see what's happening. But he told me, to my surprise, it came as a great shock, that 25% of people on ibrutinib develop high blood pressure. Now, I, don't, I didn't question him as to what that means. Is that based purely on his own observations? Is it a representative sample? Is there a comparison group? But he was certainly saying, in no, no uncertain terms, that ibrutinib brings a high risk of causing blood high blood pressure. This was news to me. I've checked the ver skimmed through, I haven't done a study of it, the various information sheets online on cancer research, Macmillan support, the um, handouts about ibrutinib. And they certainly list high blood pressure amongst a myriad of other things as something that can result. But it isn't highlighted, and in no way is it up at that 25% level. And the other thing that surprised me is that um, since going on to Ibrutinib, I've had uh, quarterly checks at hospital where they take blood counts, but not once have they checked my blood pressure. Indeed, I, the, all the 16 years that I've been going for checks, I've never had a blood pressure check carried out except when I was in hospital. Now, maybe that's my own experience, I'd be quite interested to hear if other people know this. But this is the second point I'd like to communicate. It does seem to me that if one is on ibrutinib, one really should be monitoring one's, um, one's blood pressure very regularly. It's easy enough to do. I wish I'd been, wish I'd been doing it. Um, I'd like to conclude with a short verse, I assure you it's short, that often goes through my mind whilst I'm on these walks. Um, Oh, it seems to me to talk of the CLL journey as well as everything else. It's by talking. The road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whither then? I cannot say, but not yet weary are my feet. Around the corner I may meet a sudden tree or standing stone that none have seen but I alone. And now I pass them by today, tomorrow I may come this way and take the hidden paths that run west of the moon, east of the sun. So thank you very much. <laughs>